Amen. So you're going to bookmark 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to come back there. That's going to be kind of our core chapter for the evening. Go, go if you would, though, after you bookmark that, go to Acts chapter 23, and let's start out um, there this evening. Um, we're going to start out in Acts chapter 23, and we're going to segue. And tonight I'm going to kind of give you um, the mechanics. Could, this could actually be one of the How, it, how Stuff Works um, sermon series. That's probably how we'll post it. Um, but tonight we're going to talk about, you know, how your resurrection works and how that ties to Jesus. Um, we see a little debate that starts um, in Acts chapter 23. Let's look at that, and then we'll get into the sermon um, this evening. But I'm going to show you um, from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, mainly 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is kind of known as the resurrection chapter in the Bible. All right, there's a lot of different names for chapters in the Bible. Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. Um, you, but, you know, and, and if you've read through, if you're reading through 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and you're just like, wow, that seems really complicated, uh, I'm going to kind of break it down for you tonight. All right, look at Acts chapter 23. Um, look at verse number 6. So, of course, um, Paul here is, is talking to um, the Pharisees and he had just uh, insulted the high priest. Look at verse number 6. And we talked about that last week, but when Paul perceived that one of the part were Sadducees and the other were Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope of the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. So Paul, you know, this is just more evidence that he know, knew exactly who the high priest was. He knows who the Sadducees and who the Pharisees are, and of course he was a Pharisee. And he's saying here, um, he brings up um, the resurrection of the dead, <clears throat> talking about what he's preaching, which is Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. Look at verse 7. And when he had said so, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. So Paul knew what he was doing here because he knows what the Sadducees believe, or I should say what the Sadducees don't believe. Look at verse number 8. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were part of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or angel had spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And then when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled to pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. So Paul kind of just does an a intellectual uh, trick on these, these folks here, and he gets them fighting amongst themselves to where they pretty much forget about him. All right? And he knows that the Sadducees don't believe in a resurrection. They don't believe in any resurrection. All right? So um, that, you know, puts the Pharisees against them. I mean, they're kind of like, uh, like the Shiites and the Sunnis, if you think about it, <clears throat> if you think about it that way. So he gets them arguing about amongst themselves. So you got false prophet arguing with false prophet, and then the Romans pull Paul out. But tonight, um, I want to just segue out of this and talk about the importance of the resurrection. Really, the title of the sermon is like, the mechanics of everlasting life, like how your everlasting life works, how your resurrection works, and how that's tied to Jesus. Turn to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. John chapter 11, look at verse number 25. So what happens when we die? You know, our body, this body, this mortal body that we're in is going to die one day. We don't know um, when we're going to die. You know, many people think, oh, I'll live to be 90 or 95 or whatever, but you could die at any moment. You know, you could die suddenly. <laughs> that happens to a lot of people these days. All right? Just a little, you know, side note there. All right? That won't get me kicked off of YouTube. Anyway, um, the mechanics of everlasting life, the mechanics of your resurrection is what we're going to talk about this evening. Look at John chapter 11, verse number 25. Jesus, says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So this is for the people that say, oh, did Jesus resurrect from the dead? Jesus literally says, I am the resurrection. All right, a lot of people deny the resurrection of Jesus. No, Jesus physically rose from the dead. He rose from the dead in a body. We'll talk about that body and what type of body um, that will be um, tonight. But look, Jesus had a physical, actual resurrection. He ate, people touched him. He was physically resurrected. And so are you going to be physically resurrected. All right? But the point is, Jesus was resurrected first, and then we will be resurrected later. So what happens when we die? How is your resurrection going to work is the title of the sermon. Go to Luke chapter 16. So the first question is this. When I die physically, where will I go? 
Where will I go? Like the moment that my life leaves my body and I, you know, am dead, according to doctors on this earth, where will I go at that point? The Bible is very clear about this. Look at Luke chapter 16. I'm going to tell, show you everything from the Bible tonight. There's a lot of misinformation about this. There's a lot of false doctrine about this, but it is very clear in the Bible. In Luke chapter 16, we have a story about a rich man and a beggar, and both of them die. And it's a great story because it explains one of them is saved and one of them is not. Okay, look at Luke chapter 16, verse number 22. Both of these people die, Lazarus, the beggar, and the rich man. They both die. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now, that just means like where Abraham is, okay? Abraham is in heaven. That's what this is talking about. People take this Abraham's bosom and they go make a bunch of weird doctrine about how it's some halfway heaven or something like this. It's ridiculous. Abraham's in heaven. I'll show you that from the Bible as well. Jesus talks about it. I'll show you in a few minutes. But he goes to Abraham where Abraham is. Abraham's in heaven. And then it says, the rich man also died and was buried. Look at verse 23. It says, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So immediately these two men, when they die, if you're saved, you're immediately in heaven. If you're not saved, you are immediately in hell. All right? And you're immediately in hell in torments, the Bible says. All right? So it's just like as soon as you die, you know, if you're not saved, you're in hell. That's why, you know, since the vast majority of people are not saved, this is why it's actually pretty sad when people die. It's actually a sad thing. Look, if you go to a funeral of somebody that's saved, you know, it's kind of like, let's celebrate Jesus. You know, I mean, let's not talk about how great they were. Let's celebrate Jesus. Let's celebrate what he did. Because we don't really, look, and I get it. Like, if one of you know, my family members died, God forbid, you know, before I did, you know, that would be very sad because I would miss them on this earth. But look, if they're saved, I know that they're in heaven immediately. They're in heaven. All right. So what about like, you know, this doctrine of, of soul sleep? Like there's this doctrine of, that the Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, even some Lutherans and some, you know, Protestants believe that, you know, you know, as soon as we you know, as soon as we die, our, our soul like goes to sleep. And of course, these people aren't even saved anyway. But the point is, is they believe your soul goes to sleep and then you don't get, you know, your soul doesn't come alive again until, you know, the resurrection or the day of judgment or whatever their false doctrine teaches. But that's not what the Bible teaches at all. When you die, you are immediately in heaven. Turn to Philippians chapter one. I'll show you more verses on this. The Bible is super clear on this. This is not anything that is gray, even just a little bit. Go to Philippians chapter one. The irony is that Jehovah's Witnesses and, and the Seventh-day Adventists and all these different people that have false gospels that believe in soul sleep, they're going to know immediately that they were wrong. Because they're thinking, like, when they're going to die on this earth, they're thinking, I'm going to be asleep, and they're immediately going to be in torments. Because they're going to be in hell right away. All right? Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Look what Paul says here. He says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, if he went to sleep... If you, you know, you know, went to soul sleep and you were sleeping for thousands of years or however long it was until the judgment or whatever they believed, would it be, I mean, to die would be in the ground. To die would be dirt. That's not gain. All right. But if I live in the flesh, he said, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what shall I choose? What I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two. He's like, you know, I can't really decide is what he's saying. He's saying I can't really decide whether or not I want to die physically or whether I want to stay here with you all. This is what Paul is saying. Look, Paul was a man that was in pain. We know he had some kind of um, ailment about him physically. And then he was just being beaten and stoned and whipped and everything everywhere. He had a horrible life on this earth because of the things that he was preaching, because he was preaching Jesus Christ. So he's like, you know, having a desire to depart and what? And to be with Christ. He's like, as soon as I'm dead, I'm with Christ. Now, where's Christ? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, I have it written in my Bible right here because where is Christ? Maybe Christ is in some weird place like some half heaven or, or something. No, Christ is sitting on the right hand of God, you know, he, which, who has gone into heaven, it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, and is on the right hand of God. Christ is in heaven. Paul is saying, if I, if I depart, if I die, 
I'm in heaven. That's what he's saying. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So he's saying, look, it's actually better for me personally if I just die. Because I'll immediately be with Christ and all this suffering will be over and all that. He's like, but I know you all need me here, so I'd rather, do, you know, so I'll stay. Look at John chapter 8, verse 56. John chapter 8, verse number 56. John chapter 8, verse number 56. So look, I mean, there is no soul sleep. When you die, you're saved, you are immediately with Christ, you are immediately in heaven. All right, obviously your body's in the ground. We'll get to that. But your soul is immediately in heaven with Jesus, right? And look, here's where Abraham is, right here. So the Pharisees were getting all over Jesus here, and he wasn't, you know, they were talking about they didn't believe him, and they were just getting all over him. Look at John chapter 8, verse 56. Look what Jesus says to them. He says, your father Abraham, he's talking to the Pharisees, and he's saying, you Jews, he's like, you don't even believe me. He's like, your father Abraham, because they're like, we're children of Abraham, and they just celebrate this genealogy of being from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. How could Abraham see Jesus being born and Jesus on this earth if, if he was in the ground sleeping? If he was in, you know, in soul sleep or whatever. No, Abraham's in heaven watching this and he rejoiced. He rejoiced. Then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old. They don't understand anything he's saying. And hast thou seen Abraham? And now he just addresses the age part here. It's kind of brilliant how Jesus talks to these people. He says, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Basically calling himself God. Because I am is God's name in the Old Testament. One of the names that God calls himself. So he addresses in verse 58, he addresses this whole age thing. He's like, I, I've always been, because I'm God, is what he said. But he says, Abraham, in verse 56, he says, Abraham, he's rejoicing that I'm here. Abraham is rejoicing that the Messiah is finally come. Because why? Abraham was someone that, that the promise was made to, and he just had to hope. He had to take it on faith. You see, the people in the Old Testament were saved the exact same way as we are, except they were hoping in the future. They were having faith in a future Messiah, whereas we are looking back on a past Messiah that's already come. All right? So saved, saved by faith the same way. It's just they're looking forward. We're looking back. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 8. I mean, it literally says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I mean, it just, I mean, can it be any more clear than that? When you die physically, you will immediately be in heaven. If you have been, if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you have trusted in him, you are saved, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. When you die physically, you're in heaven. That's it. All right. You said. Well, what about the, this idea of, you know, sleep in Jesus? Because the Bible does talk about people that are sleeping in Jesus. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So the Bible calls people that have died in, in several, um, several verses here that we're going to look at as, as asleep. Okay, but it's not talking about that they're literally asleep. It's talking about their, their body is in the grave and that their soul is is in heaven. We're talking about that, which means asleep in Jesus, which is the term that it uses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verse number 13. Look at verse number 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But I would have you not be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. So it's talking about the people that have died in Christ. All right, people that have died physically and are now, their soul is now in heaven, is what the Bible is calling sleep in Jesus. Now, there's something that, that's, that's extra here in verse number 14. It says those people that have died, as I've showed you in verse after verse after verse, that are now, their soul is in heaven, it says that they won't be, you know, their body won't be in the ground forever, is what it's saying here. It says, you know, these people that sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? Well, that's interesting. Bring with him where? Bring, bring with him where? It's like, where are we going? Well, I'm going to show you. You're actually going a couple places. All right, you're going to be going a couple places. We'll talk about the second one later, but look at verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So it's talking about the, the entire group of saved 
believers, some have died and are in heaven, their souls in heaven, and some are still alive. So if this happened right now, which it won't, but if this happened right now, we would be the ones that are alive and remain. All right? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of, an arch of the archangel, and with, you need to remember or underline these three words right here, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So note the trump of God here. So this is talking about, you know, the Lord himself, Jesus Christ himself, is going to come down from heaven at the, at the voice of the archangel. There's going to be a trump that sounds, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Meaning, the saved people are going to rise. They're going to be resurrected here. All right? And the dead, look, there's the order of everything that we're going to talk about tonight. So the dead, the people that have died, that were saved, are going to, they're going to be the ones that rise first. Okay? Look at verse 17. Then, you got to pay attention to first, then, after these things. I mean, the Bible's trying to like, give us the order of things here. So after the dead in Christ, the people that have died that were saved, rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So after this point, will we ever be separated from Jesus? No, we will be with Jesus forever, and we will go where he goes, and we will do what he does, and he's going to do some pretty exciting stuff coming up. All right, we're going to be part of that. It says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So it's saying, look, you know, there's going to be a resurrection. You don't have to be sad. Look, I get it. We miss our relatives that died. You know, it's really sad when someone's child dies, things like this are very sad. You know, but children we know are in heaven. You know, the Bible teaches that very clearly. And save people that we know that have died are in heaven. Yes, if we know people that are unsaved and have died, that is very sad. But that's why we want to become soul winners so we don't have that many people around us that are unsaved. Right? So we can get as many people possible saved in our lives. Because we don't want to go through that sadness. Because that's a really, truly sad thing. All right? Now, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So we're talking here about the rapture, folks. When Jesus comes back in the clouds and he grabs the, the people that have died first, that, that are in the ground, they get resurrected, and then we that are alive and remain, I don't know if that'll be us or not, um, are going to go with them all together in the clouds. We're talking about the rapture. All right? So when will this happen? All right? We're talking about the rapture here. There's two groups. Those are already dead physically. And then they're the, the asleep in Jesus, the dead in Christ, and then there's those that are still living during the time. Okay? Turn to Romans. Actually, you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to read for you Romans chapter 8 and verse number 11. The Bible says this in Romans 8, 11. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. That is saying here, it's saying that if the Spirit of God dwell in you, meaning what? Meaning you're saved. If you're saved, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is in you. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. God's giving you that down payment of the Holy Spirit. You have that Spirit inside you if you're saved. It says, even so, that, that the same Spirit that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies. That means it'll make your mortal body alive. Quicken means make alive. Okay? By His Spirit that dwelleth in you. In you. So, is anybody that doesn't have the Spirit in them going to be quickened? No. You must have the Spirit in you, be saved, and then your, your mortal body is going to be made alive. So, the question is, when? All right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to kind of work this chapter backwards. All right? Look at verse number 42. Verse number 42. The Bible says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. This is what we're talking about. All right? It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. Now, there's going to be several comparisons in each of these verses. We see here corruption, incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. So it's talking about, you know, the dead, the dead body, basically. I hate to be, you know, gruesome, but the dead body, is, it, was, it was corrupt. And it's going to be raised in incorruption. It was, it was dishonorable. It's going to be raised in honor. Look at verse 44. Again, another comparison here. It is sown a natural body. So you have what's called a natural body right now. You have flesh. It is going to be raised, though, a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there is a spiritual body. It's comparing what went in the ground to what is going to be resurrected here. 
okay, by using these words, corruption, incorruption, dishonor, glory, natural, spiritual. All right, look at verse 45. And then he gives a, a really a much deeper comparison here. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Talking about, you know, Adam, the, first, liter the literal first man that God made a living soul. And the last Adam, that's Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. Talking about the mortal man and the immortal Jesus. Given that comparison. comparison. Look at verse 46. How be it, that was not the first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. So you see that, that comparison to Adam and Jesus is the same comparison we've been using. Natural, you know, spiritual, you know, corrupt, incorruptible. You know, so it's the same, you know, same thing. The, verse 47, the first, uh, first man is of earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly, such are, are they also that are earthly. As is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have been born in the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So what this is saying is, is that you have this natural, corrupt, the Bible calls it vile in other places, you know, this body that's going to go into the ground when you physically die. But it's going to be raised when, it, when you go through this resurrection at the rapture, you're going to get a heavenly body. You're going to get a glorious body. You're going to get a spiritual body. Look at verse 15. Or verse 50, I'm sorry. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot... You say, well, why though? Why do I need a, a, a better body? It, here's why, right here in verse 50. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of God, sorry. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. There can't be corruption in heaven, this is why. This is why your body can't go to heaven. There can't be sin in heaven. There can't be corruption in heaven. There can't be vileness in heaven. Everything in heaven must be incorrupt. It must be glorious. It must be perfect. God cannot be in the presence of sin. Look at verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So that's a change, right? Isn't that a change from your, your normal, natural body that you have, and all of a sudden you're going to have this you know, spiritual, incorruptible body? You're going to have this glorified body? You say, when? It says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the what? At the last trump, at the rapture. That's when this is going to take place. For the trumpet shall sound. You see how this matches perfectly 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. At the rapture. So your soul is in heaven if you've died physically. Jesus comes back, and he is going to raise all the bodies of all the people that are asleep in Jesus. He's going to raise them. He raise their glorified bodies up, and then they will be complete again. They will have glorified bodies. He will gather everybody. Then the people that are alive and remain will be changed in an instant, just like that. And the glorified, everybody in their glorified bodies will go to heaven with Jesus at the rapture. Okay? So you're, look, that's when you get your glorified body. That's when, you know, your knees will stop hurting and you'll stop having the lusts of the flesh and all these types of things. You know, and you say, well, I'm pretty good looking now. Well, it, it just gets better. Okay? It just gets better. So you say, what's the difference between my corruptible body now and, like, my, what's the mechanical difference between, I mean, because I, you know, I think about these things, right? So what's the difference between my body now and my glorified body that I'm going to get? Well, I mean, longevity, really. <laughs> One will last for eternity. And this one's dying, right? This one's dying day by day, right? The, the cells are dying and all this. So this is the body that you're going to take to heaven and live in eternity, all right? But you're going to go other places as well. Look at verse 53 of 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 15. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. That's the difference right there. You need an immortal body. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Turn to Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to come back to this. You're going to keep your place in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, 
we see another verse explaining how our bodies will be changed here. It says, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. According to the working thereby, he is able to subdue all things unto himself. So right there, that, I mean, we could just, that's how you will be resurrected, folks. That's how you personally will be resurrected. I can say anybody that's alive today that's saved, anybody that has died in the past that is saved is going to be resurrected in this way at the rapture when Jesus comes back. All right, but here's the thing. There are other resurrections. There are other resurrections in the Bible. Now, we are not going to be part of these other resurrections. However, we will be involved in a way. All right, turn to Revelation chapter 20. So now I'm going to give you the complete order of resurrections. All right, you know how you're going to be resurrected. All right, you are going to be resurrected and given a glorified body at the rapture. However, your soul will have been in heaven already if you died physically on this earth. Turn to Revelation chapter, actually go to Revelation chapter 19. Let's just, let's just do a recap. So Revelation chapter 19. So let me just give you a, a whole end times prophecy um, synopsis in five minutes. All right, so basically, when is the rapture going to happen? So we've got the Antichrist, if the Clues and Milestones series kind of went through this, but we got the Antichrist, he's going to come on the scene, the Antichrist, you know, he's the Antichrist, okay? There's been many Antichrist leaders that are against Jesus Christ. This is the Antichrist, he's going to strike a covenant with many in Daniel chapter 7, then he's going to you know, through some massive war that Revelation chapter 6, worldwide war where, you know, millions and billions of people possibly die in this war, he's going to have, you know, a whole one world government that's formed in Revelation chapter 13. All right? Then, of course, he's going to set up this image in the temple. You know, he's going to demand that everyone worship this image of himself. Then we've got, so we've got the beast, which is, you know, the Antichrist himself. And then he's got this false prophet that's demanding people, you know, get this mark on their right hand or on their forehead, their, their right hand or on their forehead, and anybody that doesn't take the mark is going to be killed. Okay, so there's going to be this great tribulation time where the Antichrist is just hunting Christians. Just hunting Christians. This is all detailed in Matthew chapter 24. This goes on, this goes on for over three years, where this guy comes on the scene, you know, the abomination of desolation is set up in the temple, and he's just persecuting the Christians because they won't take the mark. Because nobody knows who he is. Everyone's like, oh, he's great, except for the saved Christians. They're not going for it because they know he's not Jesus. Right? Because why? What do they have inside them? They have the Holy Spirit showing them truth. Right? So look, he's hunting them for over three years. And then the Bible says that, look, it gets so bad at the very end. Tribulation such as never been seen before. Can you imagine? Look back at some of the tribulation we've seen in this world, especially against Christians. It's been bad. Right? It said it's going to be worse than it's ever been. It says... It says in Matthew 24, it's like if those days, no one would survive if those days weren't shortened. And how are those days shortened? By the rapture. Jesus finally says, I mean, in Revelation chapter 6, the people are saying, everybody that's in heaven already, more proof that people are in heaven right now. They're in heaven, they're, they're saying to, to God, how long, God? Like, God, how long are you going to let this go on? Because people are just being beheaded, they're being killed, they're being hunted, and the people in heaven are just crying out, and finally Jesus just says, enough, and he goes back and he just gets them all. And that's the rapture. That's where we all get our glorified bodies in that resurrection that we went through. Look at Revelation chapter 19. After Jesus comes back and raptures um, the saints, the saints, by the way, anyone that's saved, okay? That's a sermon in itself. The, the saints aren't like these... 10 people that some false church decided were... The saints are people that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's clear in the Bible as well. The saints are those that are saved. As soon as he gets the saints in the rapture, immediately that same day, God starts to pour out his wrath on the earth. Look at Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 11. I mean, this is the same day, like immediately after this. The saints are gone and immediately God starts just laying down the law. This is the, the trumpets and the vials of Revelation. Look at verse number 11 of Revelation chapter 19. And I saw heaven opened, and behold... Oh, I'm sorry. So, I'm still summarizing. So basically, the wrath goes on for three and a half years. The wrath of God, where he's pouring out all these vials, and these, these horrible plagues, you know, these locusts from hell on the earth. You know, he burns up a third of the earth. I mean, like... 
a good, you know, a, a third or more of the earth is killed during this time. But look, not everybody's killed, all right? And as soon as this happens, then there's this big battle at the end where these kings of the earth get together and they want to fight, they want to fight against Jesus. And this is what we're reading in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. So this is after the wrath of God has been poured out, and now Jesus is going to come and finish it. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he sat upon him, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head, on his head were many crowns. And he had the name written that no man knew but he himself. Now you think about all the pictures you've seen of Jesus when I start reading these next verses. All right? You think about all the, the Renaissance pictures of long-haired Jesus with the sheep when I start reading you these verses. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. That, def that tells us who he is right there. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's us, by the way. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule over them, rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. He just tells all the birds. He's like, you better get over here because there's going to be bodies everywhere. When, he, when Jesus is coming back with all the saints for this battle um, at Armageddon. All right? Verse number 18. That ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of the mighty men the flesh of the horses and them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies, this is the Antichrist and his armies, gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet. So this is the, the beast and the false prophet that I was just telling you about in Revelation chapter 13 that came up with this worldwide government and alliance through world war and was persecuting the Christians in that great tribulation. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them, them that wor worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. These are the first two occupants of the lake of fire right here. The lake of fire is, is, is in outer darkness. This is another doctrine in itself. But hell is in the center of the earth. And the, remnant, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. So here's the thing. We're not going to have to fight. We're going with him. But the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So he's just going to open his mouth and, and just like the words or the sword's going to come out of his mouth and just kill everybody that's against him. We're not going to have to fight at all. Jesus pretty much takes care of it all himself right here. Okay, so that's the ending. That's the ending. This battle of Armageddon is the ending of the wrath of God. But there's something else that happens. Look at verse number 1 of Revelation chapter 20. Now what happens? And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. This is the same angel, just for context. This, the angel that's called Abaddon, or the angel that's called Apollyon in Revelation chapter 9. The, the angel that's the king over the bottomless pit. That's hell, by the way. The center of the earth, the bottomless pit. This angel, he laid hold on the dragon. This is Satan. That old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. So this angel comes, and basically God just takes Satan. So the beast, the Antichrist, and his false prophet, they're thrown into the lake of fire. They're gone. They're out of the picture. Satan himself now is taken and chained and put into hell. He's put into the bottomless pit, not forever though for a thousand years. And then it says that God's going to let him out for a little while. And I'm going to explain to you why. All right, look, and it says, cast him into the bottom of its pit and set a seal upon him. They should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little seasons. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. 
And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast. We're talking about the saints, the saved here. Neither his image, neither had received his mark in their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So right after the wrath of God, that three and a half years, Jesus is staying with us to live and reign a thousand years. And look, we are going to reign with him. We are going to reign with Jesus. This is what Jesus is talking about when he talks about the parable of the talents in Luke chapter 19 and Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew, chap Matthew somewhere. He talks about this parable of the talents and he said, you know, thou good and faithful servant, I will give you, you know, I'm going to give you reign over 10 cities, over five cities. This is what he's talking about. This is where he's going to reward the people that went out and actually worked for Jesus. So look, this is going to be the time when people get their rewards. They're going to be able to rule over, you know, this, this earth with Jesus for a thousand years. We'll look at verse number five. So, I mean, it's one thing to be saved and just be like, yes, I'm saved. And look, I'm sure you'll be happy to be there. But I mean, you might as well do some work and you might as well bear some fruit in this life so you can be, you know, part of this great, um, this great event for a thousand years. So this is, you know, look at the verse number five. And, but the rest of the dead. Now, this is where we're going to talk about the other resurrections. Okay, so here we are. We're with Jesus, ruling and reigning for a thousand years. Now, let's think about this. Who is, who is in this millennial reign? You know, let's do an accounting of the people that are here. So we have Jesus. He's in charge, right? And then we have all the saints, all the people that are saved that are in their what? They're in their immortal bodies. They're in their glorified bodies. So really, we got kind of two classes of people here. We've got Jesus and the immortal saints who are ruling and reigning over the earth. And then we have everybody else. Because look, everybody wasn't killed in the battle of Armageddon. It was just the people that were in these armies and all this. So you got the whole earth of people saved, and unsaved that are on this earth during the millennial reign, that thousand year reign of Christ. So you're going to have people that are living and dying and living and dying for a thousand years on this earth. Some people that are saved, some people that are not saved. You say, well, will most people be saved? Well, you know, I don't know. I mean, probably not. Probably not. I mean, you say, well, Jesus will be there ruling. Well, Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, and many people didn't believe him. Most people didn't believe him. So, I mean, there's going to be unsaved people, folks. I don't know what the ratio is going to be. I mean, Satan's going to not be there causing trouble, but there's going to be saved and unsaved people that are living and dying during that time. All right, so you got two classes of people. The immortal people that are going to rule and reign for 1,000 years, we're not going to die. We have everlasting life. We have, you know, we're, we're eternal at that point. All right? But you basically have immortals ruling regular people, saved and unsaved. And so what's that going to look like? So for those saved and unsaved people, Luke chapter 16. That's what it's going to look like. They're going to die, and if they're not saved, they're immediately in hell. And if they're, they die and they're saved, they're immediately their soul is going to be in heaven. That's how that's going to be. So the people that are in heaven, they need to be resurrected at some point. All right, look at verse number 5 again. But the rest of the dead, see, notice what it says here. The rest of the dead, what? Live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Look at verse number six. Blessed and holy is he that is part, that hath part in the first resurrection. By the way, that's you. Blessed and holy are you because you are definitely part of the first resurrection if you're saved tonight. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So he's just saying, like, you're blessed. You're blessed if you're part of the first resurrection because you get to be a rule, you get to rule and reign with Christ during that thousand year period. Look at verse number seven. Now it gets interesting again. And when the thousand years are expired, so we're going to get back to the details on that second resurrection here in just a minute, but let's look at how this ends. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations that are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is the sand of the sea. So this is going to be the battle of Gog and, and Magog. You know, this is like people that, you know, Gog is like part of Russia somewhere, so anything that ever happens with Russia, you get all these people like, oh, the battle of Gog and Magog. I'm like, what are you talking about? 
It's like the millennial reign, has that happened yet? Did I miss that on accident? That's when you have to pay attention to like the first, the second, then, after, you know, these hard words in the Bible that tell us like what's going to come first and what's going to come second, all these things. So basically, God's going to let Satan out. He's going to let him out of hell. And he's going to go out and gather an army. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, verse 9, and compassed the camp of the saints about. See, who is ruling and reigning with Christ? The saints. On the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Well, that was quick. That was a quick battle again. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Who's in the lake of fire? So the lake of fire is in outer darkness, okay? Look, the lake of fire and hell are eventually all going to be in the same place. We're going to see that here in a second. But right now, they're in different places, all right? Everybody that dies unsaved is, is going to hell. And the only two people at this point when I'm reading this that are in the lake of fire are the beast and the false prophet. Now Satan's with them, all right? And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead. So, are these saved people here when it calls them the dead? No, these are people that are, that are considered dead. These are people that have been brought out of hell. Okay, these are people that are been brought out of hell, they, they were not saved, they did not believe, and th there's just some irony right here. It says, the books were opened. What, what is the, the books here? The books were opened, the other book was opened, which is the book of life. So we've got the books and the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things that were written in these books according to their what? According to their works. So here's the irony of it. All these people that are going to go to hell because they're trusting in their own works to get them to heaven, they're going to be judged by their works. Those books that we're talking about, that's the Bible. That's the book of the law. Those are the books of the law. That's, that's where God's going to go through their whole life and say, Here, let's see if you're good enough. And they're not going to be good enough. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Twice he says it. All these people that you talk to that are like, you know what? I believe that it is of works, and I believe that they're going to be judged by their works. They're going to get what they want. And death and hell, and this is why it says that every knee shall bow. You imagine the, the most ardent atheist out there, and he's been in hell for thousands of years, and he has brought before the throne of God. He's going to get down on his knees and beg for his life. Because they believe in, the, the moment people will open their eyes in hell, in torments, they will believe in Jesus. The moment that Stephen Hawking, the, the most, you know, ardent atheist and ardent, you know, there is no God and, and, and you know, Darwin and all these people that denied the Lord Jesus Christ, it took them about one second to believe in Jesus after they died. And they're going to beg for their lives here. But you know what? They're going to come up short. Death and hell, all the dead, all the dead, and everybody in hell were cast. It's all going to be cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. But what about the people that were in the book of life? That's the second resurrection right there. The people that were in the book of life. So this, from verse number 11 all the way to verse 15, we're talking about the second resurrection. You know, if you want to just categorize it as the first resurrection, the second resurrection. Some people are going to be resurrected unto life, just like it said um, just a few verses back in, you know, it says where they live not again, this is where they live again and get their glorified bodies just like you did in the first resurrection. All right? But then there's going to be that great white throne judgment that no believer will be at. That great white throne judgment, which is going to be a resurrection to damnation, is what that's going to be. Now go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So all this is sorted out, that second resurrection, that second resurrection of life, and that resurrection to damnation where death and hell are cast out into that outward, um, outer darkness lake of fire. That is going to be... Um, after the millennial reign of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now look at verse number 12. Look at verse number 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he 
from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now we bring it full circle back to Acts chapter 23. Right? How could you possibly say, now he's going to talk about how could you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? He's going to say, you know, he, Paul's going to sit here and he's going to, he's going to tell them, like, if there's no resurrection of the dead, we're all in trouble, is what he's going to say. Look at verse 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain? And your faith is also in vain. Yea, and we are all found false witness of God, witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. He's, he's kind of coming from both angles here. He's saying, look, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, none of the gospel works. He's like, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, like, none of this works. And he's going to explain why. If Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also, which have fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. He's saying, if, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, if that's not true, we're false prophets, and your, your relatives that are dead, that believed in Jesus, they're just in the ground. They're just dead. That's what he's saying. He's like, Christ must have risen from the dead. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are, all, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become what? Become the first fruits of them that slept. He's saying Christ was the first to be resurrected. It's a model. It's a model by God, you know, raising Christ from the dead. It was a model of what's going to happen to us. He, and he was just the first one. For as in Adam all die, Adam killed everybody. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Adam, you know, it's like, men, what did we do? We killed everybody through our sin. You know, we rebelled against God and brought death on this earth. He's like, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. It's the opposite. But every man in his own order. Now you understand the order, right? The order of things. Christ, the first fruits. Christ is first. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming, the first resurrection. Then, you notice how this fits together with everything that we've talked about. Then cometh the end. When we shall have delivered up to the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, the millennial reign of Christ. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. He, that's why he lets the devil out to gather all the people that are against him. And then he just destroys them all. And he puts all enemies under his feet, just as we saw in Revelation chapter 20. This is talking about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ right here. And look at verse 26. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That's that, that's that second resurrection. That's that resurrection to damnation. Death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. There is no more death at that point. It's cast into the lake of fire. Notice how it all fits together. It fits together perfectly. It's not, look, it's not that complicated. I mean, basically, you're going to die physically, you'll immediately be in heaven. I showed you everything from the Bible. As soon as all these end times events, you know, come to place, eventually Jesus is going to stop that tribulation that the Antichrist is putting upon us. We don't know if that's going to happen or not. Here's what I do know. Jesus is not coming back tomorrow to get us, though. This is this imminent rapture stuff. It's just, it just causes people to be like, oh, you know, I don't have to do anything in my life. Jesus, come get me now. Jesus is not. Where's the Antichrist? Where's the, where's the third temple? Where's the, where's the abomination of desolation? Where's all these things that, I don't know, the Bible clearly tells us are going to happen? Then, after, after the tribulation of those days, Jesus will come and rapture us. At that point, we get our glorified bodies. We're resurrected. We go. You know, Jesus pours out. God pours out his wrath for three and a half years. And then we rule and reign for a thousand years with Jesus Christ. After that, Satan is let out. And he's destroyed. After that, the second resurrection, all the people that died during the millennial reign that were saved. All the people that died during the wrath of God that were saved. You have to account for everybody. See? The Bible accounts for everybody. 
You got to just go, the, the second resurrection at the end of Revelation chapter 20 is just that final sorting of the wheat and the chaff. That's all that is. You got to count for everybody. I mean, it's nice that God gives us all this detail. So God's going to second resurrect all the people that are found written in the book of life, meaning what? They're saved. They believe on the Lord Jesus Christ just like you. We're all saved the same way. There's not like, oh, this, those people were saved this way. These people were saved that way. And all this complicated garbage that's not in the Bible. <coughs> and then that's it. The great white throne judgment. Everybody who wanted to be judged by their works is going to be judged by their works. And unless they're perfect, which none of them are, they're all going to be thrown into the lake of fire. They're going to be tormented forever. All right? So the point is this, folks. That's, how, that's the mechanics of what's going to happen to you. That's the mechanics of what's going to happen to you after you physically die on this earth. So do you have to worry about it? No. It's going to be pretty cool, actually. It's going to be much better than whatever you think you got going on here. All right? So it's going to be great. But the point of the whole thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Paul was making at the beginning of that, and the reason I end the sermon at the beginning of that chapter is because Paul is saying, without Jesus' resurrection, none of this is real. He's like, none of it works because he's the first fruits. He's the first example of it. So without the resurrection, we have no hope. So Paul is saying, like, what in the world? Who would not believe in the resurrection? He's like, what are we even doing? So, I mean, obviously they knew that Jesus, I mean, hundreds of people saw Jesus resurrected. They knew that it was true. But he's just saying, like, without the resurrection, it's not like you can have a gospel without Jesus resurrecting. You know, like, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're not preaching Jesus anyway. They won't even say the name of Jesus. But you can't have, like, oh, we believe everything except the resurrection. Because, like, no, like, there's no hope then. Then you just might as well, you're wasting your time. You're going to be in the ground. If you deny the resurrection, you are not saved. That's basically what Paul is saying. You cannot deny the resurrection because there's no hope without it. Because without the first fruits, there's no fruit. That's it. Hopefully that makes things a little clearer on how everything is going to go down after we die on this earth. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.